Though they manifest in all sports, Cinderella stories are few and far between. It takes just the right kind of factors for a team to earn that unique label. Usually, it's a squad of overachievers, lunch pail players that work in complete unison, overcoming talent deficiencies and a lack of stars to challenge the blue blood best. Out of nowhere, they suddenly become the darling team of the nation, as though everyone in the country is rooting just for them. There's only been one real time in Seattle Seahawks history where they could be considered the Cinderella team. Coach Carroll's first year with the Seahawks in 2010, when the Hawks won their division despite a 7-9 record, could be held in consideration. And while Beast Mode broke off the most epic run in NFL history, many at the time nationally mocked this 7-9 team being given a playoff spot. Others were downright apoplectic that Seattle was not only getting the playoff spot, but a home game against the previous year's Super Bowl champs. The blasphemy. No, the true Cinderella team of Seahawks history is the 1983 squad that shocked and titillated the entire NFL. Just in eight short years into their existence, the Hawks came within one game of going to the Super Bowl. And no one saw it coming. In 1983, Coach Chuck Knox took over the head coaching duties from Jack Patera. Patera was known for his drill sergeant-like approach that could grind on the players. So the Seahawks front office brought in Knox. He looked like one of President Eisenhower's tough old generals, but Coach Knox was actually known for being a player's coach, though his tactical approach was still old school all the way. These players in Seattle have never won. Consequently, it's very, very difficult for them to find that little minute difference of what it takes to get from the have-nots to becoming one of the haves. They have never been able to rise to the occasion and win the one game that would put them in the playoffs, for example. And somewhere, we've got to find a way to, to break that barrier. He modified Patera's wild offense into a run-oriented attack to protect his disciplined, opportunistic defense. Finally, Knox wanted to win in every facet of special teams, and he leaned on whiz kid Rusty Tillman to make the unit truly a difference maker every week. Our whole season comes down to one play. Do you understand? You got to hold on to Fellas, the if you ever sold out in your life, this is the time to do it right now. Hold on to your Now dreams, is baby. the time. Special right. I know you can do it. Hold on to your I dreams. know you can do it. Let's go. One, two, three. Coach Knox did an outstanding job of utilizing what Patera had already built while adding his own stamp to the team. He switched the Hawks' defense from a 4-3 to a 3-4 but kept talented young pass rushers Jacob Green and Jeff Bryant. The rising superstar of the defense, safety Kenny Easley, took his game to the next level after the defensive change, recording 17 interceptions in just a two-year period. Yes, 17. On offense, Knox made sure the front office found him a pure thoroughbred, the kind of bell cow back who could run behind stacked boxes and predictable play calling. He found that player in Penn State running back Kurt Warner. The Seahawks gave up three picks to trade up for Warner to select him third overall just behind John Elway and Eric Dickerson. Right from the first carry of his career that went for 60 yards, Warner appeared well worth the cost. His 1,449 yards led the AFC in his rookie year. It was no fluke. This season he showed every skill you could want in a running back. His shake and bake was unmatched in the league since perhaps Walter Payton came along in the mid-70s. Combined with his panoramic vision, surprising power, adept hands, and sweet feet made Warner's ascent towards greatness appear inevitable. Though not the best, he certainly lays strong claim to being considered the most talented running back in Seahawks history. Halfway through the 1983 season, Seattle was a middling 5-4. Quarterback Jimmy Zorn's play had really started to deteriorate, culminating in a Week 8 game against the Raiders, where despite playing the whole game, Zorn only threw for 13 yards. Coach Knox made the switch to Dave Craig, and the team took off. He has some great qualities. One, he's got a strong arm. Two, he's got great vision. He can see the, the field. Three, he's got 
a certain charisma in the huddle. He's kind of a street fighter guy. He's an unselfish guy that the team rallies around. The AFC West was a dogfight this year, boasting three teams in the playoffs at the end of the season, including the Seahawks. Seattle hosted Denver in the first round. The Broncos weren't ready for the thunder and passion of the kingdom. The Hawks made the Broncos look like donkeys on that day. Next up for the Hawks, they would travel on the road to Miami and play a Dolphins team that had just gone to the Super Bowl the year prior when they didn't have Dan Marino, which they did now. Legendary head coach Don Shula oversaw the remnants of the Killer Bees defense, including a pair of real brothers at safety, Lyle and Glenn Blackwood, also known as the Bruise Brothers. The Dolphins were still elite defensively, allowing the fewest points in the league this season. The transition to more of a pass-happy attack had just begun, thanks to gunslinging wonder kid Dan Marino and a pair of young future Pro Bowl receivers in the Marks Brothers, Duper and Clayton. It was not hard to understand why the Dolphins came into this game heavily favored to win at home. After both teams started the game by trading punts, the Dolphins' offense started to lean on their rushing attack. When they did pass, it seemed every throw was to Mark Duper on an out route. Seattle's defense was very concerned with the big play, and Duper's speed had the Seahawks' corners playing off coverage to make sure they didn't get beat deep. Miami patiently worked their way up the field until Marino found his tight end for the game's first touchdown. Seattle was able to answer right back. Rusty Tillman's special teams showed why Coach Knox considered that unit just as important as the offense or defense. The big kick return set up Seattle at midfield. Kurt Warner started to pile up the nice runs, forcing Miami to bring eight men up into the box to stop him. Quarterback Dave Craig took advantage, hitting his fullback on a short flare route for an easy touchdown. Kicker Norm Johnson pushed through the extra point, and Seattle took the lead. But not for long. The Dolphins drove right back up the field. Despite seven defensive backs on the field and Mark Duper already catching six first-half passes, he was able to use his speed to burn past cornerback Dave Brown. Casually heaving the ball off his back foot, Marino couldn't have dropped the pass in the bucket any better. And if the route and catch wasn't impressive enough, Duper withstood Kenny Easley's vicious collision to maintain possession for the score. It's hard to say if Duper was concussed on Easley's initial hit or when Kenny landed on his head, but Mark quickly clutched his helmet in pain and his teammates needed to help him to leave the field. The violence in this first half was ratcheting up. It was always the case in playoff games of this magnitude, everyone swinging from their heels. The Seahawks got the ball back and Warner maintained his ongoing slippery brilliance on the day, slithering and sliding his way to another solid run, and then on the next play, showing off the hands that helped him catch 42 passes on the season. It was noted on the telecast that Seattle kept coming out in the same one wide receiver formation over and over, aligning Steve Largent to the weak side of the formation, only to then run the ball strong side. Bob Trumpy, who provided the color commentary for this game, postulated that this was because the Seahawks coaches had noticed the Dolphins rolling the safety over early to better ensure they maintain their tight bracket coverage on Largent. One less defender focused away from the run game created too big of an enticement for the man that went by the moniker Ground Chuck. Coach Knox might have been offensively conservative, but he had the guts and a keen feel for knowing when to let it all hang out. Faced with a fourth and one, and within Norm Johnson's kicking range, Knox trusted Warner in the running game, and the former Penn State great delivered. Despite having the running game rolling, Seattle inexplicably went back to the pass. Craig put an absolute dime on Seahawks number two wide receiver Paul Johns, but he couldn't pull it in. Then Dave overthrew Largent on back-to-back -back plays where Largent appeared to have fooled the double team with his corner route. It's a testament to Largent's route running supremacy that he could fool two separate defenders two times in a row on the exact same route. Norm Johnson came out to try a tough 47-yard field goal into the wind, off sloppy middle field conditions. 
To reach that distance required a low trajectory for the kick, which caused it to get blocked. Rusty Tillman calmly let Norm know he didn't appreciate Johnson's worm burner. Safety John Harris covered for Norm's miss when he managed to pick off Dan Marino near the end of the half to ensure Seattle remained within one score. As the second half started, the Seahawks team had to feel good about their situation. They had Marino and the Dolphins offense mostly contained. Kurt Warner looked like he was good for five yards every run, and the Hawks hadn't even gotten the passing game going yet, with Steve Largent held without a catch in the whole first half. To open the third quarter, the Hawks carved out a few first downs, but then quickly punted. Shout out to punter Jeff West, who recorded his second tackle of the day using his tried and true limp-wristed running technique. Notice the hands at his side, swaying like a southern belle looking for a suitor. The Seattle defensive backs returned to their off coverage, and Marino resumed attacking those soft zones with Mark Duper. It was his eighth catch of the game, but he took another stiff shot that literally sent him right to the bench. These old school playoff games were not for the weak, and as Duper missed the next play, the Dolphins tried to get by until his return, going to the run. Seattle had already knocked the Dolphins starting running back out of the game, and now took advantage of the backup running back in his penchant for fumbling, punching the ball free to stop the drive dead in its tracks. An intense Dave Craig and company returned to the field. Earlier in the game, number two wide receiver Paul Johns dropped a perfectly thrown ball in the back of the end zone. With Largent drawing the consistent double teams, Craig went back to Johns deep, and this time he was able to hold on to the pass. The big play gave the offense the shot of energy they needed, and Kurt Warner was able to punch it in from there. The Dolphins proceeded to have a rough offensive series. Jeff Bryant gave Marino's ribs a rattle so hard that on the next play, Marino couldn't even keep his grip on the ball. After the Dolphins punted, the Seahawks offense started to run out of options. The Dolphins finally figured out how to slow Kurt Warner, and Steve Largent's ever-present double teams were unrelenting and as annoying as two toddlers crying. The Seahawks punted the ball back, but again the defense came through with an interception built squarely off of teamwork. At the snap, the defensive line works together to attack the left side of the Dolphins' pass protection. Defensive tackle Joe Nash squirts through to pop Marino on the throw, and cornerback Kerry Justin jumps the route at just the right time for the pick. The Seahawks' offense took the momentum and pieced together a solid drive, managing to secure a field goal and extend their lead to four. The Seahawks' defense again got another stop. Keep in mind, this was a unit that was last in the AFC during the season, but today they were putting the clamps down on the electric Dolphins offense. By the fourth quarter, the defense was dropping a metric ton of defensive backs into coverage, showing no fear of Miami's running game. The Dolphins offense struggled to find any answers. A couple of times in this game, Dave Craig flirted with throwing an interception by trying to force Steve Largent the ball through too small a window. With Steve held without a catch going deep into the fourth quarter, Craig got desperate to get him going, again throwing the ball into too tight of coverage and was intercepted on Seattle's side of the field. The game had just been in hand. The defense had been on point for most of the day, but you could feel the wind leave their sails as they returned to the field in a tough position. Miami was able to easily score a touchdown. 3.30 left in the game. Dave Craig, showing the brass balls of an Alaskan fisherman and the kind of gutsy resolve Seahawks fans would come to love, went right back to Largent, who split a double team for a 16-yard catch. Then on the next play, Largent sells the post route to get the safety to bite inside. And the second he hooked that fish, he cut back outside and turned on his Mach 2 jet engines that no one ever really gave him credit for. For 57 minutes, the Dolphins shut Largent out with their constant double teams. But there's a reason the man is in the Hall of Fame. The opposition's best cornerback, double teams. Nothing can stop Largent, not for a whole game. Kurt Warner made Largent's two big plays count. He took the pitch and began his trademark glide and slide. He's running nearly full speed, but can cut up field whenever he wishes. 
The defense, after a day of defending against his cutbacks, maintains their gap control. Warner reads this, stretches the run, sees the tight end's great seal block, and dances through the corner of the end zone for a touchdown. The score puts Seattle up by four. Absolute jubilation. Folks back in Seattle were screaming out their windows and dancing on their couches. Now the Dolphins would have all their timeouts and a little over a minute and a half to win the game. Certainly enough time for this scintillating rookie quarterback. But Hawk fans actually had some confidence. No one expected them to be here. It was like playing with house money. Plus, it felt like the momentum had shifted at just the right time. And throughout the second half, the defense had mostly shut down the Dolphins. As they had all day, Rusty Tillman's special teams unit came up huge and showed again why they were a difference maker. Dolphins kick returner Fulton Walker led the NFL in kick return yardage this year, but he met his match on the next Seahawks kickoff. The coverage unit fired down the field like an attacking platoon of Marines coming downhill. They swallowed him up, spit him out, and took the ball back. Seattle was going to win. No, they were really going to win. There are those moments when time can slow down at the end of football games. The seconds on the clock tick as if in slow motion. Seattle did his customary, running the ball three times into a stacked Dolphins front, but Kurt Warner accidentally got pushed out of bounds on third down, preserving the Dolphins' final timeout and leaving a minute 16 on the clock. Norm Johnson hit the field goal, extending the lead to seven, but that unease had returned. Dan Marino was fully capable of getting up the field in that time. And then, as if they hadn't shown off enough on the day, Rusty's Rottweilers bit themselves off another bite, as on the kickoff, Eric Lane stuck his helmet on the ball and knocked it free. Dr. Dan Dornick recovered, and the deal was sealed. Game over, Seahawks win. This fledgling Seattle Seahawks franchise just shocked and shook the football world. This win was one of the biggest playoff upsets in the last decade. Only eight years into the team's existence, they were headed to play in the AFC Championship. The players seemed to understand the gravity of the moment, carrying Knox off the field as a sign of respect. The coach arrived with a vision that he implemented with a holy man's resolve. He utilized the building blocks Jack Patera had fostered and trusted a quarterback from a college that no longer existed and created a winning blueprint that carried many similarities to Coach Carroll's teams in the future. The Seahawks would lose the next week in Oakland. Hard as it was to be one game away from the Super Bowl, this felt like the beginning of something special. Kurt Warner was ready to challenge for the best back in the league. Largent was still in his prime. On defense, the Hawks had a great, young defensive line and a talented secondary ready to take off. Sometimes, though, the magic of one season ends at the beginning of the next. In the first game of the 1984 season, Kurt Warner blew out his knee on the unforgiving Kingdom AstroTurf. This was before the medical innovations of today that could have returned him to near new. Not only was Warner lost for the season, but outside one more monster year, he was never quite the same player from his rookie campaign. The Seahawks were unable to reach the mountaintop under Coach Knox, but his tall coaching shadow loomed over his immediate replacements for years to come. That's the thing about Cinderella stories. The chimes of midnight always strike. At least the dance was fun while it lasted. Rest in peace, Coach Knox, and thank you. Let me tell you something. One great battling job. I tell you what. Yeah! Hey, 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 hit it, hooray! Hit it, hooray! Hit it, hooray! It's been a while since I've gotten one of these, and I know for our football team in particular. And we just like to, on behalf of the players on this football team, Chuck, we'd like to recognize you, give you the game ball. Chuck! 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 Chuck!